Thank you, Elaine. Jesus walks with us always, doesn't he? About well, two weeks ago, I, I had an idea of <coughs> where this sermon was going to go and how it was going to take place. But that changed. That changed because of what we've seen happening in the world today. I need to ask you, I want you to start thinking about it. Anybody angry? We're going to talk about anger. We're going to talk about righteous anger. First, I'm going to ask you, does God love you? Yes. Are you sure? Yes. Amen? All right. Well, John 3.16. For God so loved the world, he gave his only son. He gave Christ so that you and I might live. But what's the expectation for us? Are we to love others? Unconditionally, right? Loving others. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Our world is missing love today. You know, I don't know how many of you have been watching the news recently. My sermon was going to go one direction. One direction only, and all of a sudden they changed. We had bombings. We had a truck driver running down innocent people, men, women, and children in France. People that were just out spending some time as a family. Somebody who was mad. But what really caught my attention, what really started changing this, was on July the 5th. A young man by the name of Alton Sterling, a 37-year-old black man, was shot in a struggle with two Baton Rouge, Louisiana police officers. And then on Wednesday, another man was shot by a police officer. And what was really disturbing is that we could watch this on television as it was happening. And then the next day, another person who was mad, who was angered, he killed five police officers and wounded seven others. And then just that Friday after that, last week on Friday, there were other attempts on officers' lives. But you know what the scary thing about this is? And maybe it's just for me, maybe not for you. But do you start forgetting about these? I mean, do you start forgetting about the man in Florida? They shot 49 people, a terrorist. Do you forget about the attacks in Paris that happened earlier? I mean, we become numb to this. It's an expectation that happens every day now. San Bernardino, California, just last year. How many of you remember those shootings that took place? A husband and wife went in. See, the scary part for me is you start to forget. As a society, we're facing a lot of different issues. Issues that we probably had never faced before. We're facing terrorism. We're facing issues with race. We have people of color who are treated differently, not only by the police, but by other people. They're treated differently because of the color of their skin. And what do I mean by differently? I mean that they're not being treated with dignity and respect. 
Because of the color of their skin, they fear. They fear driving down the streets. They fear racial profiling. There are police officers today who are afraid. They dedicate their lives to protect and serve. They fear for their lives every day, especially now. And in fact, and if you caught the news, a 12-year-old boy was involved in a burglary to steal guns to kill police officers. That was in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Police officers like those in Dallas, those police officers, they were there to protect protesters who were protesting about the shootings. Police officers who, in fact, were holding up signs and joining, more or less, in the protest. They agreed with them. There needs to be something to be done. And while protecting, they were shot down. We are a country facing a lot of different problems. We're facing violence, terrorism, racial issues, racial intolerance. People who judge other people because of color or because of their religion. Let me ask you, is this the country our founding fathers probably dreamt of? It's not, is it? Let's go back and take a look at that. <laughs> our founding fathers in the Declaration of Independence, when they were angry, because they faced taxation without representation, a lot of other things. They declared their freedom. And they said, we hold these truths self-evident that not just some men, that all men are created equal. And that they are endowed by the Creator, God, with certain rights, these are natural and legal rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. People in our country today don't feel like they have these rights. They don't feel like they're being treated equally. They don't feel like they're able to seek out life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. When you look at the preamble to our Constitution, after we won our freedom, and we developed a constitution. It said, we the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, we establish justice, domestic tranquility. We're going to promote order, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, that is health and happiness, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. That's the future generations do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. Our country was founded on biblical principles. But today, more than ever, we are facing attacks on our religious liberty. I want to tell you about one. California. In most Religious institutions, most colleges that are faith-based, they integrate in their education, religious faith, and all aspects of the curriculum, and their campus life. Faculty and students alike, they are held to a moral code with religious teachings. Prayer is often part of the class, and it's required. Religion classes are required for graduation. Attendance at worship is expected. In California, under Senate Bill 1146, the latest version of this bill, it says universities and colleges that receive financial assistance from the state or if they enroll students who receive financial assistance from the state, those students would no longer be able to limit their admission to, of students or employment of people of those particular religious faith. Nor would these schools be able to maintain certain conduct, certain morals, 
certain religious teachings. That, in other words, religious values cannot be indoctrinated into the curriculum. Nor would these schools be able to have housing policies or other policies that are based upon their convictions and faith. So in other words, what I'm saying is, married students, housing must be made available to both married opposite sex and married same sex couples. How many of you knew about this, that this was going on in the state of California? You say, Pastor, well, that's the state of California. Folks, once it starts in one state, yeah. it'll move on to other states. Basically, what this is saying, an Adventist university could only enroll Adventist students, but an Adventist university could not enroll non-Adventist students and at the same time maintain its Adventist moral policies. We'd have to change all because some of the students that we might have in our colleges would be accepting government funding. The other thing that we think about, don't we think our colleges are a great outreach to a lot of students? Yeah. Now, there are people, there are churches, and there are universities that are opposing this. Loma Linda, is one of the universities that is opposing this. Pacific Union College. Several other alliances. And they're working on this. And you say, okay, that's, that's California, Pastor. What about Iowa? Okay, let me tell you a little bit about Iowa. On July 4th, there was a lawsuit filed by two churches, one in the Des Moines area and one in the Sioux City area. And this is what is called a pre-enforcement challenge. It's against the Iowa Civil Rights Commission on their pamphlet that they put out about church teachings and biblical sexuality. In other words, what they could force churches to do. The Iowa uh, Civil Rights Commission came out with a pamphlet clarifying what was illegal discrimination. And this is what the illegal discrimination says. Refusal or denial of any accommodations, advantages, facilities, services, or privileges on the basis of sexual orientation or gender identity. Also, any discrimination in providing such services. And then on this pamphlet it said, does this apply to churches? Can we be separated? And the answer was, sometimes. It says, Iowa law provides that these protections do not apply to religious institutions with respect to any religion-based qualifications. When such qualifications are related to bona fide religious purpose. Here's the catch, though. Churches are still subject to the law's provisions if they have a child care facility, operate at the church or church service. Do we have a church service here today? Yeah. Open to the public. Okay. Under the Bill of Rights, it's a collective name for the first ten amendments. And that first amendment under the Bill of Rights guarantees us our rights as citizens. It's basically saying it prohibits any type of governmental establishment of religion. It gives us the free exercise of religion, of being able to worship here today. It also gives us the freedom of speech, freedom of the press, the right to assemble, and on and on. These things that I talked to you about today, about what's going on in society, do any of these things bother you? Do they make you angry? Are you concerned? If so, my question is, I want you to think about this. What are you going to do about it? What did Jesus do? 
when Jesus became angry. And it says in Mark chapter 3, Jesus entered the synagogue again. And there was a man there who had a withered hand. And so it says, so they watched him closely. Now who was they? It was the Pharisees, Sadducees, right? The rulers of the law. They were wanting to see what Jesus was going to do. And he said to that man, he said, step forward. And then he looks around. All these people he knew that were waiting for him to make a mistake in their eyes. He says, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil? To save a life or to kill? But all those people that were going to accuse him, what did they do? Get silent. Yeah, they were silent. And then he looked around. And with anger, this is the only time you'll see this word next to Jesus' name, and with anger. What made him angry was the hardness of their hearts. Because they didn't love. They didn't care about that man. All they wanted to do was prove that Jesus was wrong. And Jesus asked him to stretch out his hand. And he did, and he restored it, and he made it whole. Now, there are two other times that I believe you'll find that Jesus was angry, upset, but it doesn't use the word anger. In John 2, Passover had come, and Jesus walking into the temple, he saw sheep and oxen being sold, and the money changers doing business. They had turned this temple not into a place of his father's, but they turned it into basically a shopping mart. And he made a big whip of cords, and he started dragging them out. Now, it doesn't say that he struck them. But basically, he had this whip of cords, and he was going to get their attention. And he drove them out. He overturned tables, and he said, Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. There's a second cleansing in the temple, and that's in Matthew 12. This time, Christ goes into the temple, and there are people who are buying and selling. Now, he didn't make a whip this time, because it's not loaded. <laughs> and he started overturning tables, and he said, It is written, My house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. You see what they were doing? They were overcharging people for sacrifices, for the temple tax. He was mad because they were stealing prayers by doing this. You see, this is righteous anger. Righteous anger is when there is an injustice. There are people that are being taken advantage of. So, what do you do when you get angry? Do you sulk? Do you brood and become more angry? Do you yell? Do you yell at the walls? Do you kick the car? I kicked the car and I got, almost got arrested. It was my own car. <laughs> do you tell everyone else how angry you are? Or do you say, oh well, there's nothing I can do about it. That's in California. Righteous indignation, righteous anger is unfair treatment and injustice to others. And God calls us to act. If you're a Christian, or you call yourself a Christian, and you're not provoked to some type of anger or annoyance when others face unfair treatment, there may be some things that you need to think about. How many of you have ever heard of Dietrich Bonhoeffer? Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a pastor who grew up in Germany. And he opposed the German government. He opposed the things that they were doing. And he used his voice. In 1938, Dietrich Bonhoeffer left Germany. 
to go to the United States. Dietrich Bonhoeffer wasn't in the United States very long when he said, I've made a mistake. I need to go back. I need to be your voice. Dietrich Bonhoeffer went back, and in 1945, he was executed. But that voice, that voice raised issues to the government. That voice said, silence in the face of evil is evil itself. You see, there were very many German people that knew what was going on in those Nazi cancer, concentration camps, and they didn't say a thing. God will hold us not guiltless, he said. Not to speak is to speak. Not to act is to act. Ephesians 9, in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. In other words, sin not. Don't anger because of feelings of personal resentment or vindictiveness. Basically, your anger should be directed toward the wrong act and not the person. And to be able to do these two things is a sign of great Christian achievement. So, pastor, what can we do? You can pray. You can pray for your country. You can pray for your community. You can pray for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. You can pray for peace. You can pray for families that have lost loved ones. You can become educated. Don't let these things go past you. Keep an eye on the news. Keep watch. Talk to your leaders in your communities. Talk to state and federal legislators. They will listen. Encourage and support. Start dialogues, especially with people that might be different from you. Those are some of the things that you can do. So if we do all of these, Pastor, what will happen? Well, late last week on Friday, after being sued by the two churches, the Civil Rights Commission of Iowa made a change in their path. You see, you had church leaders and church leadership. You had Christians that took a stand, and they made a difference. Amen. And many of you didn't even know it. Dietrich Bonhoeffer also said, the ultimate test of a moral society is the kind of world that it leaves to its children. We worry about our world today. We know from the book of Revelation what's going to happen. But just because of that, do we step back and say, oh well? Or what should we be doing? If you're a Christian, here's the character. Therefore, as the elect of God, what we should do is put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, bearing one another, forgiving one another, and if anyone has complained against another, even as Christ forgave you, forgive them also. Putting on that bond of love and letting the peace of God rule through us. <laughs> because we were called as one body to be whole. Let the word of Christ be in us. Richly. Give us wisdom, teaching. And whatever we do, do it all in the name of Jesus. As Christians, we should be people of action and not people just sitting in the pews. Amen? Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Vacation Bible School. Why do we do what we do? You know, I was talking about anger. I had uh, two little boys that Sarah and I, it's a family that we've been mentoring with. They're from Eritrea. And Sarah went to get the little boys the other night so that they could come to vacation Bible school. This family, his parents had been in uh, refugee camps for over 15 years. And they just recently came to the United States. 
Little boys are just as sweet as they can be. I have another young man who just recently came from Ethiopia. He's only six years old. The other two boys are eight and six. And this other young man, he's six years old. When he first got here last fall, he couldn't speak any English at all. But because of our school system, he speaks excellent English today. And these three young boys, along with ten others, were all in the same age group, and Sarah was introducing them. And the one little bit boy from Ethiopia said, Oh, you're from Eritrea? You're my enemy. And Sarah said, No, it's all right to be friends. And you know, they were friends. It was like that was a third brother that had now joined them because of the love that they had. And all it took was somebody just to say, no, it's all right to become friends. And in fact, on uh, Tuesday night, when the little man showed up, he ran up to his friends and said, hey, bros, how you doing? He's really becoming Americanized. There was another little boy who had never been to vacation Bible school. And it was about the second or third night, his dad said, hey, I'll take you fishing. He goes, no, dad, I want to go to vacation Bible school. And he showed up. And on Thursday night, we especially talked about Jesus. Jesus dying on the cross. Dying for us so that we might be with him. And he asked, you mean Jesus died for me and he didn't even know me? And I said, yeah, he loved you so much. So then last night when we were doing the final program, and I asked a question, why did Jesus die? And that little boy shot up and yelled out, because he loved us so. As Christians, especially we are called to do something. We are called to be part of our communities. We are called, even though we know what's going to happen to the world, we are called to make a difference. We're called to reach out to people. That's what each one of us is doing, especially in your Sabbath school today, I thought it was appropriate. It's telling us to get up out of our pews and do something.